Hi guys, it's Chris here. So yes, I do take a boat to work. This is where I live. I don't live in Melbourne City. I live on the Bellarine Peninsula, which is across the bay from uh, Melbourne City. So every day I have to trek over the water in that direction and Melbourne's just over the horizon there. I've just arrived at this location to find that my stabilization gimbal is flat. So this video is going to be a little bit rocky, but I'll do the best I can. In this week's vlog, I caught up with Caitlin Gourlay, who is your principal tutor, and we talked about her work uh, coordinating the entire tutorial program for Mind, Brain and Behaviour 1, and how she uses neuroscience in her everyday work as a researcher. Okay guys, so we have been joined by Caitlin Gourlay, who is the principal tutor for the first year psychology program. You can see we're hanging out here at the very noisy uh, Potter's Cafe right now. And uh, I wanted to introduce you to Caitlin because she's been moving behind the scenes and organizing about 60 tutorial classes every week for you guys. So say hi, Caitlin. Hello, everyone. <laughs> um, I've met some of you already. Oh, you have? Yes, yeah, so I have two classes of my own and I've popped into a few tutorials already, so... Excellent. So, Caitlin, you have a very big responsibility. Uh, you're looking after the entire tutorial program for Mind, Brain and Behaviour 1. Yes. What's that like? Well, so far it's been very busy. Starting off the first week of tutorial classes happened last week and so that was a very, very busy week for me and for all of your tutors. Um, but it's also been a lot of fun planning and organizing your practical classes. We use tutorials and practical classes interchangeably. I think there's sometimes some confusion about that, but we try and make our tutorials also a practical class. So we're learning practical skills while also having a bit of a tutorial and thinking about our psychology content as well. That's excellent. It is really where we pick up the skills around psychology, isn't it? The lectures are more about content. Yeah, absolutely. And we are able to actually, so you learn facts and information about psychology phenomena. And then when we come to our practical classes, we can actually apply that knowledge to real life situations and think about what it would be like if you were a researcher or if you were a clinical psychologist, or even if you're just a person existing in the world, how that information and knowledge about psychology actually affects you. So it's really interesting. Excellent. And speaking about uh, how we use psychological knowledge. Uh, the students have just had uh, a few weeks of neuroscience lectures yes. with Jason Fort. Yes. I'm wondering, what is your area of research and do you apply any neuroscience related uh, techniques or theories in your research? Absolutely. So my PhD project uh, was looking at the effects of alcohol on sleep in young people. And so basically what my study did is we gave uh, 18 to 21 year old adults, probably many of yourselves could have been participants when I was co collecting data, um, and we would give them a dose of alcohol before bed and then we'd wire them up to polysomnography or electroencephalography or EEG equipment, which is where we stuck electrodes on the scalp. Um, and then we'd actually uh, let the participants sleep and we'd see the electrical activity of their neurons while they were sleeping and so the different types of uh, activity that was going on or the def different types of electrical activity happening while they were sleeping would tell us the different stages of sleep they were in whether they were in really really deep sleep um, or whether they were in really really light or dreaming sleep which we call rapid eye movement or REM sleep. That is Fascinating. That yes. sounds like a really interesting project. It was a really fun PhD project and um, it, the only thing that was bad about it was that it did involve staying awake all night. <laughs> mm. So that was hard, but yeah. worth it in the end. You know, I imagine that students are going to have questions for you about your research. Alcohol and sleep and yes. the EEG study, it sounds really interesting. Um, can they maybe contact you on the discussion board yes, about that? Yes, please. I love talking about my PhD research and I think you'll find that every researcher likes to talk about their own research. So never be afraid to ask anyone questions about their research and what their interests are.
I also promised that I was going to answer your common questions about assignment one. So here they are, in no particular order, the three most common questions that I'm receiving about assignment one. No, you don't need to do a literature review to support your research project uh, for this assignment. It's my intention that instead you think creatively about the content that I presented in the first five research methods modules and apply that to the research question that you choose for your assignment. The answer to this question is very much connected to the answer to the last question. You don't need to do previous research for this assignment. However, if you do draw upon some literature to, for example, define something in your assignment, then you should acknowledge that previous author in some way. You should provide an in-text citation and a reference to acknowledge the full source of the original source uh, in your work. I'm not really too worried about you using APA style, but you can if you want to. Again, please do not worry too much about this and get hung up on this. My uh, real intent for you for this assignment is to focus on thinking about research design and applying concepts creatively to your chosen problem. So the answer here is quite simple, literally. I don't want you to worry about statistical procedures that I haven't taught you yet. That would be really mean of me to um, assess you on things that I haven't taught you. Instead, I want you to just think simply about how you could examine the data to answer the question that you're putting forward in your hypothesis. If it's a correlational design, then more than likely you're going to compare scores on one variable with scores on another variable in the fashion that I've described in my discourse around correlational research projects in the research methods modules. If it's a between groups design, then more than likely you'd compare scores on average in one group with scores on average in another group to uh, see which group had a higher score or a lower score, for example. So really, for that part of the assignment, I just want you to think very simply and have a clear plan for what you would be looking at in the data to answer the question that you put forward in your hypothesis. To answer any final questions that you have about assignment one, I'm going to hold a live stream this coming week on YouTube, and I will publish the details of that live stream in advance so that you can either check in live and ask me questions live there in the moment, and I can respond to them there in the moment, or you can have a look at the live stream once it's been recorded and published. That's it for this week's vlog. Next time, I'm going to be talking to a neuropsychologist about how she uses the type of content that Jason has been lecturing you about in her everyday work. I've got a list of guests lined up to come and speak on the vlog. We've got clinical psychologists, we have got psychologists that specialize in well-being, uh, and well-being of students actually, and we've also got, believe it or not, animal trainers coming to join us as well. So that's going to be a special treat to keep an eye out for. Until next time guys, take care and I'll see you on the discussion board. Oh,